chapter 10. I want to read verses. I'll start at verse 1. Just follow me here. I want to skip through a couple of passages here as we get to the meat of what I believe the Lord wants to say to us. Amen. Are you there? Are y'all with me? You got, your, you got your listening devices turned on. You got your, your brain ready to hear the word of God. Amen. I just want to make sure sometimes we got to break the break the stuff that's going on in our brain so we get our hearts ready for the word. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 10, starting in verse 1 says, And when he called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Let's get down to verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Another way of saying that has drawn near. Verse 8, heal the sick, he says, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver or copper for your money belts, nor a bag for your, money, your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor staff, for a worker is worthy of his food. Now, whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy and stay there until you go out. Verse 12. And when you go back into the house, greet it. Are you with me? Yeah. Amen. Verse 13. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. If it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. I mean, every once in a while, you got to shake the dust. You just got to move on every once in a while. Verse 14, and whoever will not receive you nor hear your words when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Surely I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And then verse 16, behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. The last verse I want to read is verse 22. It says, And you shall be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. I want to speak to you this morning from the subject, Difference Makers. We are Difference Makers. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. I humble myself unto you. I pray today, God, that you would quicken our hearts and our spirit to hear your word. But God, don't let us just hear it. God, challenge us that we'll leave out today, God, with firm conviction to make a difference in the world in which we live. We thank you and we praise you. Let your anointing rest upon me, God. The humanity in me cries out to you and asks for your divine anointing, the mantle of your anointing to rest heavy upon me. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Just read to you Matthew chapter 10, pretty much verses 1 through 16, where Jesus is commissioning his disciples to go out into the world. Verses that really capture my heart. Verse 16 is a word that I believe that speaks to all of us today. He says to them, he says, Behold, I send you out as sheep amidst wolves. Therefore, you must be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And then he says to them in verse 22, so that they don't, uh, they don't mistake it, he says, and don't mistake the fact that you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. I know we're living in a time where uh, many in the church hearts have become heavy and it's beginning to fail them for fear and anxiety or just frustration because of all that we see in our society. But I believe God has a word for the church today about who he has called us to be. I've come to learn that the, ch the church shines the brightest when the world is at its darkest. Yeah. Amen. I thought about the analogy of a, I'm a sports fan, and so I love to watch football and basketball. Football's getting ready to start. I'm excited about that. But until football starts, I have to watch basketball. So I look at the NBA, look at the MLB, all of that. Well, 
In the NBA, there is one particular player that is head and shoulders above the rest. And unfortunately, while you may be a hater of this person, I'm the one that has the mic, so I get to say it the way I want to say it. His name is LeBron James. I know, I know we got some haters in the house here. Just saying about the doubters and the haters. And obviously, y'all didn't listen. That's all right. That's all right. We're going to preach you holy again. Amen. But there, there, there's this player, uh, uh, this prodigy, if you will, uh, by the name of LeBron James. And those of y'all that know sports know that if you followed him, that he was so good at basketball that in high school, uh, the NBA started recruiting him uh, so that he didn't have to go to college. Uh, usually it's colleges that are recruiting you, but the NBA would, would set up uh, broadcasts at his high school game just to watch him play. And they would talk about the fact that he was destined to skip over that developmental stage of college and go straight into the NBA. And the interesting thing about LeBron James is that when he got to the NBA, there was a very interesting uh, impact that he had. Uh, he started off with the Cleveland Cavaliers. Amen. And we got the Cleveland folks in the house. He started off with, we got one, I should say. Amen. He started off with, he started off with the Cleveland Cavaliers, a team that had been horrible for many years and instantaneously had a great impact. You don't have to like it, but you have to acknowledge the reality of the facts. He left Cleveland and joined with two of his friends in, in, in Miami, Florida, a team called the Miami Heat, and instantaneously, by going there, that team became a contender for the championship. In fact, while he was there, they won two championships, and, and while you may hate him, if he had left the other two players, they could not have won without him. And get no amens right there. <laughs> He, he, he leaves Miami, just stay with me here, I'm setting up the words. He leaves Miami and goes back to Cleveland, who still hadn't won anything yet. I don't think since 1952 they had not won a title. He goes back to Cleveland, and, and, and he goes back to Cleveland, he goes back to Cleveland. Guess what happens? <laughs> Those of you that know anything about the NBA sports, if you know who won the championship this year, you know it was the Cleveland Cavaliers for the first time since 1952. Now this is this this is not whether you believe it or not, Sister Sandy. This is not in, intended to uh, raise up Cleveland, but it is intended to say that, that there, there's some people, uh, whether it be sports or various places in life, when they are present, things just change. They, they, they just make a difference that nobody else can make. This, this is a guy whose skill set that no matter what team he's on, he always makes a difference. He always has a way of changing the, dy the dynamic. He's a game changer. And even the people who hate him recognize that, you know, I don't like him for this reason or that reason, but he is a game changer. <laughs> and I believe today that God is speaking to the church and saying that uh, LeBron is not the only game changer around. But God has called the church, you and me, people who know Jesus Christ, he's called us to be game changers in the society that's stuck in the cy a cycle of hate and dines at the table of immorality. Amen. He's called this church to be a difference maker in a culture that scoffs at righteousness and spurns holiness. His church is called to be a holy medicine that he can use to heal the deep wounds of those who've been battered by life and overtaken by darkness. Amen. God placed great power and responsibility upon the church. And he's called us, you and me, as his church, to be difference makers. To be game changers in a society that seems to be going in all the wrong directions at a real fast pace. See, if you do a little study of the church... Uh, uh, on the actual creation of the function of the church in ancient times, you'll learn that the church was actually created for more than just having services on Sunday morning. Amen. It was created for more than just having a beautiful building and name recognition, but the church in ancient times actually had a direct influence on the culture and society that surrounded it. The word church is the word ecclesia. The church we read of in scripture didn't just exist as part of the culture, but it took a leading role in the culture. It actually set the tone for the culture and for, for society. But before the church can help to define it, uh, the culture of the society, it first has to be able to define itself. 
Ecclesia was God's uh, vehicle to fulfill his will on earth. He said these words. He said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. This is a statement of influence. One that says, Lord, let your will, your desires be filled in the earth and in the church. You and I serve as a part of a body that is a vehicle for God's plans and fulfilling his will in the earth. In other words, it was never God's will for the church to take its cues from society. It was never God's will for the church to take its cues or its pace from culture and society. But his power should be working through the church to influence culture and society. Saints, we should not be bowing at the knee, bowing our knee at the altar of compromise. But the power of God through us should influence people to bow their knee at the altar of repentance. All I'm trying to convey this morning, saints, is that while we may live in a godless culture, we have not yet been called to remove ourselves and become complainers on either side of the aisle. But we've been called to take the light of the gospel, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and the love of Christ to a dark world. I told you last Sunday that you're going to probably see a different preacher over the next however long. Because I've decided that I'm no longer just only, I, I need to preach to you, I need to preach to your challenges and your problems, but I've learned that if we just preach the word, it hits us all right where we need it. I need to preach a gospel because we're living in the last days. We need to preach a gospel that is a great commission gospel. A gospel that will reach people who are hurting and need to understand the healing power of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So I'm preaching to the church today to teach you and to encourage you and exhort you that God has called you to be a difference maker in this culture. God had called us to be complainers on either side of the aisle. But we've been called to take the light of the gospel and the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the love of Christ to this world. I'm reminded of the story of Joshua. I love the way Dr. Tony Evans tells this. In Joshua chapter 5, verses 13 through 15, when the children of Israel were about to overtake Jericho, the Bible says that Joshua saw a man. It was a spiritual being. And him getting ready to go into battle, he looked at this man who had a sword drawn, and he says to this man, he says, are you for us or are you against us? Yeah. This man says, I'm not either for you or against you. I'm not here to get on one side or the other side, but I've come to take over both sides. God has called the church not to take a side. God has not called the church to get on one side of the aisle, but he's called us to take over culture. He's called us to use the influence that he's given us to anoint what's happening in this dark world. One of the things, however, is that we must always remember as people who make up the church that in order to really uh, make a difference of, for Christ in the world, we must first remind ourselves of, that our first origin of citizenship is not the United States. Amen. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians 3.20, For our citizenship is in heaven, for which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, you and I are not of this world. We're God's representatives here on this earth. We're only someone said pilgrims passing through a temporary land. Our pain is temporary. Our troubles are temporary. Our circumstances are temporary. In fact, according to 1 Thessalonians 4.16, it says these words. It says, one day the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall also be with him. Can I tell you today, church, we must never forget that this world is not our home. We have an eternal home in glory. And sometimes what happens around us can deter and distract our focus and focus it on what's happening around us. But God defy the church to be a church that forgets that God has not called us to lay our roots down here in the United States of America but our roots are heavenly roots our roots are godly roots our roots are roots that exist in heaven and so while the world may be happening around me every once in a while I get overwhelmed and overcome by what's happening in my life and I look towards heaven and I say thank you Jesus that one day soon and very soon you will come Prepare a place for me. If I go, I'll prepare a place for you. 
place that's foreign to you unless you realize that you're not from there. Many years ago, I had the occasion, which was very educational for me, to go to an embassy in Washington, D.C. It was a foreign embassy. I won't tell you the name of it because there's unrest there now. And you don't need to know. <laughs> but I went to this embassy as a part of my job. And at this embassy, I had, I had never been to a foreign embassy. And what I didn't realize when I got to that embassy is that the way embassies function, foreign embassies anyway, is that while I was in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. when I went inside this embassy, they said to me, welcome to, and they named the country. I looked at my supervisors, and I said, unless y'all lock me out, put me on a plane, and I'm just waking up in a place that looks exactly like Washington, D.C. I thought I was in Washington, D.C. They explained to me the fact that embassies have what's called sovereign ground. They, they, they exist in a place that the United States has enabled that embassy to actually function according to the rules of their nation while they're yet still in the, in the United States. So when he said, welcome to this particular country, literally the rules that that country has established are, are in, in place, in effect, while I'm in that embassy. Now, I can take five steps outside of the door of that embassy, and now I'm back under the rule, rulership of the United States. But if I go five more steps back into that embassy, I'm back under the rule of that nation. It was amazing to me that I could be in one huge surrounding place and go into a small building and enter an entirely different country. Hmm. And, and it began to speak to me about the world that surrounds us. Do you understand that God calls us ambassadors of him? That we are ambassadors of Christ and, and that while we live in this world, we're not of this world. That a little piece of heaven should follow us everywhere we go in every aspect of our life. That we're literally citizens of heaven. I might be in the United States, but I live and reside and walk and think and sleep and speak and preach and do all that I can. Well, I'm not troubled. You know, I don't talk about politics, but I'm going to talk about just one, just 10 seconds. I'm not troubled about what's going to happen in November. I don't care who gets, I care, let me, let me rephrase that. I care, but let me tell you some of you saints who are totally troubled and you're getting into frustrated and heated debates. Can I tell you that God is the same God of Romans 13 who says all authority is of God. His hand is on whoever. We mess some of y'all up real bad right here. The Bible says in the book of Romans that there came a time when the children of Israel, God had called them to holiness. He called them to be the children of God. They decided that they were not going to walk according to his will. So the Bible says he used the Gentiles. Some of y'all gonna follow up one minute. He used the Gentiles, the despised people, the people who nobody liked, the people they thought that uh, they were nothing. He used them and put them in a place of prominence for the purpose of drawing the Jews back unto himself. Sometimes God has to allow some stuff. The United States has become a demonic. I know some of you all are too inextricably linked to your political view to hear what the word of God just said. But I don't preach a political view. I'm not preaching to you one side of the aisle or the other. But I'm preaching you the word of God. We're in a place in the nation where we need the hand of God. And I've learned that sometimes God will use cruel and evil dictators. I'm in the book. You can read it. 
to bring his people back to where they need to be. Yes. You see, some of us ain't going to pray as long as our current president is in office. But if somebody gets in office and really rubs you, guess what you're going to do? <laughs> Let me move on. I'm not advocating. Trust me. Sometimes what God wants, I don't want. I'm not advocating one way or the other, but I'm saying that we have to put our trust in God and realize this is not our home. It really doesn't matter at the end of the day. We're called to do more than just coexist. We're called to be a difference maker in this dark world. I want to share a few characteristics for the remainder of my time, just a few more moments, of what difference makers actually look like based on the text that I read this morning. First of all, we see that the disciples in this passage in Matthew chapter 10, they caught, God called these 12 disciples, and the Bible says that he gave them power over unclean spirits. He sent them out and commissioned them to do the work of the kingdom. The thing I love about the fact of the disciples, though, is that they were just ordinary men. I thank God for that because I'm an ordinary man. I'm an ordinary person, and, and so when I need to relate myself to someone, I can look at the disciples and see that they were jacked up just like I am in many ways. And I thank God for that. You are not just ordinary people. God uses ordinary people. He uses ordinary people to, to do his work and to do his will. We all have our own story. Yeah. We all have our own uh, experiences in life, our own filters of life, and our own background. But God has chosen us to do extraordinary things. Yeah. First Corinthians 127 says, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. And the base things. The, of the world, the things which are despised by God, he has chosen in the things that are not to bring to nothing the things that are. A true disciple will never allow the enemy to tempt them into believing that they're just ordinary. Sometimes the enemy will try to tell you all kind of bad stuff about yourself and make you believe that you're just ordinary. But God uses ordinary people. Difference makers understand that they're called by God. I'm moving quickly for in the interest of time. Not necessarily called to an out front ministry, but they're called and marked by God for his purposes. Amen. Verse 1 of the text said that he called his disciples unto him. Isaiah 43, 1 says, But now thus saith the Lord who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by your name. He's the one that calls you unto himself. He says further in verse 2 of this chapter, When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. That's right. That word water in Hebrew is the word mayim, which represents chaos. It represents the chaotic, stormy seas at the time of creation. So because he's called you by name, he will not allow the chaotic, stormy seas of life to overtake you. Water also speaks to life and substance. God knows how to sustain those who are his. Difference makers understand that they have delegated authority. I'm moving quick because I want to get to certain points here. Difference makers understand they have delegated authority. In verse 1, the text says he gave them power. If you look at verse 1, I want you to see that. And when the disciples called, when he called his 12 disciples to them, he gave them power over unclean spirits. See that word power? Amen. The word power there is a different word than our English word for power. You with me? Amen. The Greek word power there is the word exousia, which doesn't necessarily mean what we call power. It actually means authority. So he, it said he gave them authority over unclean spirits and authority to heal. That word there literally means authority. And this is important because we have to understand that there is a difference between power and authority. See, the world, even the enemy, has power. But God is the only one that has all authority. He's delegated that authority to his church, to you and to me. What's the difference between power and authority? Well, you see, you can have power, but in order to use it, you've got to have authority. Just because you have power doesn't mean that you have authority. You remember the story of Job when the enemy came to uh, God and he, he, said, he, said, he said to God, he said, I want to test your servant Job. He had the power to test him, but he had to get the authority from God. 
See, a football game, another analogy I love from Dr. Evans, the football game, you have two different sides, but you also have a third element. You have the teams that are competing, but then you have also the referees. The football game, you have the players, and they're usually big and strong and fast. And you have the referees who are typically old, sometimes fat and slow. <laughs> You're referees <laughs> but while the refs might be older and have less strength and less power, they have one thing that the players don't have. Sorry. Players have the power to play in the game, but the refs have the power to put them out there. Sometimes Satan presents himself as this big, bold, strong, powerful being that is more powerful than you, that's bigger than you, and you feel so weak before him. But just remember, God has not called you to be a player in the game. He's called you to be a referee. When you raise your hand and speak on your mouth and let your tongue begin to go like the goodness of God, you don't have to look like the biggest or speak like the biggest, but the authority of God is inside of you. Two words for Thank you, Lord. power. The word exousia, which means authority, and the word dunamis, which means dynamite or power. Exousia means I've given you the authority. The word uh, dunamis means dynamite. That is the actual acting out of that power. So God has done two things for us. He has not only given us the authority, but he's given us the ability to release yes, the dynamite, yes, the dunamis, that's the English word, dynamite. Amen. He's given us the ability to release that at the right time. And so when the enemy is trying to come in and plant all kinds of things around you, God has given you the authority by the words of your mouth and the words of the scriptures to release and hit the dynamite button to blow up everything that Satan tried to put in your place. Amen. That's why he said to the disciples, he says he called them to him and he gave them authority over but if you read a few verses later, he said that then he told them, now I want you to heal the sick. I want you to speak to the blind. I want you to preach the word. I know some of y'all think that all that power and authority is reserved only for the preachers. But I came to tell you that you know the same God that I know. And it's the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Thank you. 
Understand their mission. The Bible says in verse 5 that he didn't just send them out with authority, but he sent them out with a command. It's dangerous. That's why we took time to do this ordination we did this morning. It's dangerous for people to have power and authority, but have no ability how to utilize it. It's reckless to give influence to people who are not responsible with the authority that God has given them. So he says to them first, I'm giving you authority. But then he says, I'm giving you a command. He says, I'm telling you how I want this thing to be done. Verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent down and commanded them. He says, don't go into the way of the Gentiles and don't enter the city of the Samaritans. Then he goes on further and he tells them, I want you to be clear about what your mission is. I want to tell you that there are times when life is going on along just well. And suddenly the perils of life will set up camp at your doorstep. But I love the words that Jesus spoke to Peter about the power of his church. See, the thing that is hard for many unbelievers when they get saved uh, to, uh, to realize is that it doesn't mean that things are all of a sudden going to get better. In fact, sometimes it gets worse because not now you got Satan fighting against you. Sometimes life just don't happen the way we like for it to. But I love what Jesus says to Peter. In Matthew 16, 18, he says... The gates of hell, he, we know the whole thing that precedes that, but he says, I give you the keys to the kingdom, and he says, and upon this rock I'll build my church. And then he says, the gates of hell shall not be victorious against it. He used the term gates, plural. What gates are you facing today? The gates of sickness. The gates of depression. The gate of hate. The gate of fear, the, the, the gate of immorality, the gate of demonic resistance, the gate of division and relational turmoil, the, the gate of bitterness, the gate of hopelessness, the gate of unforgiveness, the gate of confusion, the gate of disappointment, the gate of anxiety, the, the gate of burnout, and the gate of defeat. What gate are you facing today? When he spoke those words to Peter, he said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. And so as God sends you forth on your mission, understand that there will be gates situated around you, but God has given you the strength and that no gate will prevail against you. What do we do with gates? We walk through gates. The enemy wants you to believe that the gates have no opening in them, but God has given you the ability to walk through the gate and he's given you a key to open the door of the gate. I wish I had time to stay there, but I don't. These disciples understood the scope of their mission. Difference makers understand the scope of their mission. I read to you verse 5 and 6 where he tells them exactly what to do. What he was really saying to them is don't get distracted. It's very easy in life sometimes to get distracted. Distracted by things that compete for your attention. Distracted by your desires. Distracted, distracted by the unexpected. Distracted by what's happening around you. And speaking about distractions, listen to what Winston Churchill once said. You'll never reach your destination if you stop and throw stones at every dog that barks. I know you got some dogs barking right now. Stuff in your life is just, it's just barking. But I've learned that those words are true. You don't have to stop and address every dog that barks. You ain't got to throw a stone and try to shut every mouth that opens. Amen. 
that will distract you from your mission. He said to them, he said, I don't want you to get distracted. I want you to realize why you're here and what your mission is. What is your assignment? Your assignment is to use the influence God has given you to offer hope and eternal life to the lost and administer healing to the broken. Beside what you think your responsibilities are, your primary responsibility is to be a healer to those who are broken. Amen. Speak life to those Amen. who need life. That is our primary responsibility. They also understood the substance of their mission. Verse 7 says, as you go preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand or has drawn near. He says, you go into this dark world, you must never forget the substance of why you're here. I need to condense this. I run out of time. He says, I want you to always remember that the world will try to change the substance of your mission. But you must never forget it. You know what I like so much about commercials? I listen to commercials sometimes when they're trying to sell you something. Cell phones, things like that. They'll go through all this great stuff. We'll give you this. Our price is going to be lower than the contender's price. And we're going to pay all of your termination fees up to this amount of money. Or when you get the car ad commercials, when they tell you you can get this kind of car for this amount of money. But I love the last five seconds of the commercial. Press the button or something to check it out. So what I've learned to do is to realize that what they say in the last five seconds really is the most important thing. What they're telling you is that the prices I've just quoted you are subject to change at any time. And this, this contract that we're talking about is contingent upon you meeting certain requirements. Instead of using the time of the commercial to give you that, they give you all the fluff and the good stuff. I've learned that the world thinks that there's a disclaimer on the gospel. After we close the book, the world will recognize the book. The world will acknowledge the book because they have no choice to. But they like to close the book and give you a disclaimer at the end of it. Based upon what's happening right now in our culture, these things are subject to change. Based upon what a politician tells you, these things are subject to change. Based upon what, some, what somebody thinks or what they've gone to school to study and think they believe is the right thing, these things are subject to change. But I came to tell you the word of God is immutable. That means it doesn't change. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He said to the time, he said, when you go out, I want you to understand the substance of your mission. Understand that what you're speaking, I don't care who you come against. You might come up to a sorcerer who can mimic the power of God. This does not change anything. I am still the sovereign and supreme God. It doesn't matter what people tell you. It doesn't matter how philosophical they are. The word of God is established and it is settled. I know you don't want to offend people. I know you don't want people to think that you're judgmental. But can I tell you that every once in a while, somebody needs to be offended in order to follow their needs and give their heart to Jesus. Come let me try to finish this. I want to preach it for a minute like I'm feeling. I know we live in a world that tells you that you can't be a judge or judgmental person. That if you judge that you are bigot and all of these things. But I came to tell you that when Jesus encountered people who were in sin, yes, he sold them love, but he ended his words with his own disclaimer. Now go and sin no more. I can tell you that I love you, but you got to come. But far be it from God's own people to adopt a mentality where we close the book in our times of devotion and we put a disclaimer on it. Well, because things have evolved, my God, because things have changed and people have changed and times have changed, the word of God perhaps we've evolved in our understanding. Can I tell you that God blew evolution out of the world? Need to evolve. 
sandals, no staff, for a worker is worthy of his food. In other words, he told them, you don't have to worry about when you feel ill-prepared to meet the demands that are before you. I will be your help. Oh, what great words. When you're facing life and you feel ill-prepared to handle what's in front of you, he says, I will be your help. Before they would go on the journey, they would normally take extra money and extra clothes and all of these things. He said, this is a different kind of journey. When you go on this journey, you don't need to take anything extra. I will be your mouthpiece. I'll give you all that you need. Sometimes there's some things that will chase you down that you just weren't prepared to see. But as Jesus sent them out, he told them, I will be your sufficiency. I've placed in you all that you need to face what's ahead of you. Amen. You can play as I finalize this, they understood the method. The method was that, saints, we don't have time to waste. <coughs> Said when you go into these folks' houses, if they're willing to hear your message, stay there with them and invest your time. But if they don't hear your message, Reverend Mike, he said, I want you to leave that house. I want you to shake the dust. And I want you to move on. Some of y'all need to get the dust off of your shoes from some places that you're trying to stay that God has already said to you. Let it go. You don't have time to waste. One of the hardest challenges of a pastor, my wife and I talked about this often, it's because God gives a pastor a, a certain kind of heart, a pastor's heart, that you really almost feel like you want to be everybody's savior. I mean, I, I don't know how else to say it. That, that's the heart of a pastor. You, you feel like you need to fix everything and be everybody's savior. One of the hardest challenges for a pastor is to know where to invest his or her time and when to divest their time. When to step back and say, that all I can do. Now I need to put my energy where it is going to yield some fruit. And saints of God, sometimes you have to know where to invest your energy. There's some people that you're ministering to that you're trying to tell them the right way. They're not hearing you. You might need to divest your time and go somewhere else. That sounds hard. We don't have time to linger when there are people who are crying out saying, I want to know, I want to do right. She needs somebody to come and help me. Yeah. We're spending our time with folk who just taking us in circles around, yeah. Yeah. around, yeah. around, and around. Yeah, that's true. And I've learned how to say to some people, I love you. Yeah. But I got to go. Because there's somebody over here who needs me. They want something different. You like the attention, but you don't want to change. You like me giving you advice, but in two more weeks, I just told you how to manage your money, but in two weeks, you're going to be broke again. Just being practical. You're just lingering with these people. Sometimes you need to let it go and say, I'm, I'm done. I love you. But there's somebody over here who really wants this. That's what Jesus said to his disciples. He said, when you go to these places, you're going to have some people that invite you in. Oh, yes, we hear what you say. Yes. Oh, yes, we love God. Yes. But you see no fruit. Leave that house. Shake the dust. And go somewhere where your time will be used as an investment. I encourage you with that today. God has called us to be difference makers. He's placed in you the authority 
may not be the most powerful person in your sphere of influence, but you have authority by the power of the Holy Spirit. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. God, I thank you today for your word. I thank you for the hearts of your people. God, I pray today that you would help us. Help us truly, God, to realize the power that you have placed in us. That God, we will make a difference through the power of your Holy Spirit in every area of our lives. Let our homes be influenced. Let our jobs be influenced. Let our church be influenced. God, from a missional perspective, let our community be influenced as a result of the authority we place in your church. I pray, Father, for anybody today who may be going through a circumstance or situation that they may feel is bigger than them. They feel like they can't make it through. I pray today, God, that you would speak words of encouragement to them by your divine grace and your mercy. We thank you in advance for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name. Maybe there's someone here today.